Hi, Dr. Armour. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yes, we can. Excellent, excellent. Um, how's it going there? We have a lot of breaking developments over here uh, around campus protests. Um, and that's one of our subjects, right? Is there an encampment at USC? Oh, yes. There's been one that's been um, cleared I out. I heard about but... UCLA. Yeah, no, we've had uh, two times the police have visited the campus. Um, and the most recent one was about four, three, what is this? This is Wednesday, three days ago. And then before that, about a week and a half. So we've been grappling with that problem. And in fact, um, I'm going to have to deal with a academic Senate question uh, in a little while, right after we talk, having to do with whether there's going to be a no confidence vote uh, in the president and the provost of the university because of the responses to the protests. So we're, we're, we're in the middle of it. It's going down as we speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, our camp is still there, but um, the police, the state police have not been invited um, since the 27th. Right, right. Uh, so, yeah, so let's dive into the conversation because, like I said, I'm going to be, uh, right after we talk, I'm going to be in mm -hmm. front of the academic senate uh, discussing whether we should ask for the resignation of the president and provost right away because of uh, what's been going on on our campus. Mm -hmm. so we we so we had a similar vote, and the faculty voted no confidence. And it, it wasn't until I heard you say that that I wondered. So that's that's a phenomenon that's going on across campuses that this is happening at. Do you think that weakens the power of asking or maybe strengthens it? I mean, I'm just thinking like if our president and provost don't resign and, and they have that no confidence, does that kind of weaken the the rhetorical power of you uh, forming that vote? Uh, no, I hear what you're saying. You know, it might seem therefore like an empty threat, but it's understood going in that we don't have the power to hire and fire, that's uh, completely something that is delegated to the Board of Trustees, right? So they have the last say, the ultimate power, but a vote of no confidence sends them a strong signal that they should think hard and long about whether they should keep on these central administrators and it lets the central administrators know that they don't have much in the way of trust and confidence by the people that they are administrating, right? And um, so it is, it really is, is, is pretty profound for a faculty to tell its leadership that we don't trust you, that we don't have confidence in you. It changes the acoustics in every room they walk into from then on right so yeah you know e even if they don't immediately step down it it is a it's a powerful um express it serves a powerful expressive function and so as you know um our commission um advises the city government obviously not the university um although the university is within the city uh so it also uh is within our commission's purview and um, the three of us formed this special committee to try to follow up on specific reports that we have received from um, students and community members who were at the uh, protests. Um, so if I could jump in with a question. Sure. Um, uh, and so I've actually been reading your book. Right on. And um, so I've learned uh, that racism is a tool for otherizing people, otherizing people for the purposes um, of using uh, um, using armed force, and in this case, specifically militarized 
force. Um, and our, our city's mayor in her first video address on this topic actually made some controversial statements that some people might view as xenophobic, including mentioning that the response was triggered by reports of outsiders. Oh, outside and, agitators, always. And right. yeah, yeah, and those with outside agendas. Oh yeah, outside um, agitators again. And so, yeah, and and then later she actually issued a follow-up video because she was apparently contacted by students who let her know um, what they felt about these comments. And she issued a follow-up stating that she had been referring to white nationalists. However, um, we've actually seen photographic and videographic evidence that white nationalists were at the protest, but they were standing with the counter protesters um, at the Chabad house and waving at the American flags. Um, and so, um, and those were truly outside agitators, but that isn't what she meant. She she was demonizing right. and, the protesters as you know having this, outside and, agitators. In addition, the state police superintendent, when he was interviewed, he stated repeatedly he mentioned the word martyrs repeatedly, as in Islamic apparently martyrs. Oh, and yeah. he said there were threats of an event of mass murder were his words that um and he also claimed that he heard protesters sympathize with Hamas um and uh he also stated that the counter protesters where we have actually seen had white nationalists with them he stated they were very polite and that they offered the police cold cold drinks and water and they were very <laughs> polite and uh, what factor like the counter protest in the CCLA? What factor does racializing? Sorry, I'm getting to the question. Such a long question. What factor does racializing and otherizing our community members play in whether local public safety threats are deemed to warrant a militarized police response? Oh yeah, you know they play a big role, of course, uh, and you you laid it out very nicely how they are appealing to certain kinds of tropes, uh, the trope of the outside agitator, the trope of the Hamas sympathizer, uh, tropes that are intentionally there to otherize. That's the whole point, to rob their reference of any sympathy, empathy, care, or concern, you know, um, and to humanize the counter-protesters who happen to be white supremacist identity nationalists. Uh, right. So it's an old playbook. It's a very old playbook. And it sounds very much like this is uh, what's going on there. And maybe I can share with you a kind of framework that I'm using to think some of these issues through. Thank um, you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that, you know, this, this framework, uh, applies not only to college campuses, but also to police departments outside those college campuses that are called onto the campuses to address protesters and quell what they view as, um, you know, protest dissent of, of different kinds. So, you know, when you're looking at these um, kind of these campus protests and, you know, thinking about police force in the in this context, there are really two kinds of disagreement. Right. What the first is a deep kind of substantive disagreement about the justice or injustice, say, of the war in Gaza. Right. There's that deep substantive kind of disagreement that people have about whether there should be a ceasefire, what's going on, whether it's justified for there to be the, the military response that Israel is directing toward the, the people in Gaza now. All of that's substantive, right? All that's a, a, a kind of set of substantive uh, disagreements. But there's this second disagreement about, which is going on on college campuses now, which has to do with how people should debate and argue that particular substantive question, how their debate should be carried on. 
is, in other words, most point, no, most to the point, is civil disobedience mm -hmm. permissible? And if it is, how much disruption from civil disobedience should be tolerated? Number two. And then number three, when should the police come in? Mm -hmm. Right? So those are three different kinds of questions. I'm not going to address the first substantive disagreement at all, right? That's important. That's a whole nother can of worms. Instead, I want us to focus on how we should process those substantive disagreements on the college campuses. How should we handle these difficult conversations on the campuses when they come up, right? So, mm -hmm. the you know, kind of going in, you know, I, I I like to think about what we're what we're talking about is is civil disobedience. Disobedience. People are not following the rules. That's the point. Right. <laughs> the point of civil disobedience is disobedience. <laughs> right. Uh, the civil part. Yeah. Yeah. Disobedience. Okay. And w w when I think about uh, civil disobedience, um, the people. And who say that it's the protesters who are at fault because by protesting, they've ended reason and dialogue because they're breaking the rules. Right? That, that's what you oftentimes hear them say. Mm -hmm. But like I said, civil disobedience by definition breaks the rules. Martin Luther King, John Rawls, and Ronald Dworkin are people I draw upon, along with many others, who view civil disobedience as a way to continue the democratic conversation, right? Even though the law is broken, they see it as a way by breaking the law of continuing a big democratic conversation, right? When they break the law, peaceful protesters who engage in this kind of civil disobedience are trying to engage the rest of us in a conversation about justice. That's what they're trying to do. Those who engage in civil disobedience, in other words, are saying that our legal democracy, the, 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 you know, that's being expressed in our policies right now, that our legal democracy has made decisions that are unjust. That's what they're saying. We have, we have reached decisions that are fundamentally unjust. They're democratically reached, no question, but they are unjust. Right. That's what they're saying. And they would say that in the 1950s when it came to racial segregation and Jim Crow. The, the, it was, you know, the law said segregation was fine. The democratic process said segregation was fine. They were saying, though, that the de democratic process itself gave us unjust results. So that was certainly true in the 50s in the 60s and 70s. You know, we were talking about the unjust war in Vietnam. In the 80s, we were talking about, you know, apartheid investments, right? Um, mm -hmm. In 2000s, you know, we were talking about merchandise and sweat labor in Southeast Asia, et cetera. So a lot of times what they're saying is the results of the democratic process are skewed, are, are unjust, and we are going to engage in rule-breaking civil disobedience to challenge that. And we're going to, this is part of a conversation that we're initiating, right? Mm -hmm. And they felt they couldn't get a fair hearing through those normal legal channels. That's why they're going to the, the civil disobedience, right? They couldn't get that fair hearing. So they felt that, the, you know, the, 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 the legal channels were blocked for whatever kinds of reasons because of either prejudice or rig rules or money, or raw power, or whatever it was, they, they were saying that you, they couldn't get a fair hearing through the legal channels so that they were going to try this alternative route, right? Um, and, you know, in the 50s, we told them, well, don't go that illegal route. Just be patient. And, say, and, and Jim Crow will go away. Just be patient, right? In the 60s, we said that the protesters were, who were protesting in Vietnam War were un-American. <laughs> that you're un-American to, 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 to resist the, mm -hmm. the Vietnam War back then. In the 80s, when I was doing, when I was their age and, and fighting against South African um, and you know um, apartheid and divestment and that, we were told that 
constructive engagement was better than divestment. We should constructively engage with them and try to change the, you know, the system that way. Um, and so, you know, it's often hard to tell, you know, which side has justice and morality on their side when you're in the middle of these debates sometimes, right? Which side has justice? Which side will be historically vindicated, if you will, right? One thing I can say, though, and you can and you can check this yourself, think about it yourself, canvas any of these protests we've mentioned. I can't think of one time when a mass movement by students from board, from coast to coast has arisen when they haven't been on the right side of history. I can't think of a case. I can't, you know, it's amazing, really, you know, because and I think it has something to do with what it takes for an issue to bubble up to that point that it goes coast to coast and all of the students are just mm -hmm. kind of saying, whoa, we, there's, there's a consensus that emerges among these young people that, oh my God, you know, and, and, and so it's a, a pretty good indicator that you're on the right side of history mm -hmm. if you follow um, what, the, what the students have done. So first, you know, uh, the framework I'm thinking about to, to approach these issues in is first, how bad are the different instances of civil disobedience? Assuming we're going to say some civil disobedience is some, something we're going to tolerate. Maybe some people aren't going to say that. But first, we got to figure out what are the different instances of diso civil disobedience? How bad does the civil disobedience have to be to warrant the intervention of the police, to warrant police action, right? So how bad is the civil disobedience? I think I'm, I'm thinking of an article that was written in like 2012 by the former dean of Berkeley Law School, a guy named Chris Edley and uh, Charles Robinson. They wrote this article in 2012. Um, I highly recommend it, uh, uh, which they wrestled with some of these questions. And for them, the very first question they dealt with is how bad it has to be, how bad the civil disobedience has to be, that is and what is tolerable, especially at a university. We're not talking about a private corporation, a private company. We're talking about a university setting right now. And he set up, they set, they set up a kind of ladder of harm for civil disobedience, okay? A ladder of harm from, uh, you know, in severity, from low to high. So let's start with the low end. The low end of civil disobedience would be civil disobedience that breaks the rules, but is not disruptive. Okay, breaks the rules, but isn't disruptive. So, yeah, and, in a public park. <laughs> right? So, so say encampments that are orderly, orderly encampments, but require maybe an extra some extra physical plant grounds, you know, and maybe security to monitor, right? Some so extra resources, but not disorderly. Okay, that's that. that let's say that's one yeah. severity level one, severity level two civil disobedience that is inconvenient, but tolerable, inconvenient, but tolerable, right? And so that would be, you know, encampments that are orderly and peaceful, but require minor relocation of classes, you know, or exams, or office work, and extra security and groundskeeping, okay? That would be level right, two. Like trash removal, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So that that would be level two. Level three, in terms of severity, would be civil disobedience that disrupts important university business. Okay. Now we're getting to the maybe not tolerable. So, for example, protests that are so loud that it interrupts teaching or studying, mm -hmm. or protests that block many students and faculty or staff from going to classes or offices or protests that prevent graduations from occurring, right? That like kind that of level three. Like Columbia University when the students took over the building. May, yes, perhaps when the, when the students took over the building. That, mm -hmm. and when I was at Harvard, we took over the administration building there. Wow. Um, and I, I saw in 2001, they took it over again. When I was doing the South African stuff, they took it over again in 2001. And the university just let them stay there for 28 days. They moved the president, everybody wow. else just moved to another building. Yeah, right? and, yeah. <laughs> and they waited on they waited and they eventually came up with in 28 days in a, a resolution 
Uh, they went in. Uh, they went in with the campus security. They showed there was no no property damage or anything. So, but level three, yes, definitely uh, disrupts important university business. Okay, and then level four. Now we're at UCLA, right? Level four. What we saw ha happening there is the civil disobedience creates an imminent threat to safety, especially life, right? And so let's say the melee again between the UCLA protesters and the staff and students who are trapped in the building, or as you're saying in, uh, possibly if you have staff and students trapped in a building and can't get out because the protests are taking it over and you know there's just no way out. So that would be level four. So there you have it, level one, two, three, and four, right? What about so the first protesters like? Because I heard at UCLA, the real threat to violence, the real violent threat was from the counter protesters. Absolutely. Where does that, that fall? That's, a, that's absolutely, that's, that's potentially four. But what you do is you intervene to quell the counter protesters, right? And therefore reduce the level back to three or two or one, reduce the level of threat. You don't do what UCLA did. Do nothing about the counter protesters right. for <laughs> three, four them. hours. And then when you do do something, you come and you attack the protesters. Right. The peaceful right? protesters. So that, right. they have it completely backwards there. But um, okay, so the first so, so the first question is that you know, once we have that that kind of high once we have, I'm sorry, let me put this back up here. You all right? Okay, yeah. I, I, gotcha. I, I feel like you got hurt, even though you're, you're just on the screen <laughs> when you make that fall. But uh, I've been watching too many cartoons. Um, so, so first question is, uh, and when you're looking at that kind of hierarchy or breakdown, right, is how much disruption is a specific protest or encampment causing, right? That's got to be the first question. And what I've been shocked by and about is how much the disagreement there is about what would seem to be a straightforward factual question. Either it's one, two, three, or four. You think, <laughs> okay, we can get an agreement on that, but right. I see wildly different opinions about well, whether it's one, two, three, or four. Well, actually, the state superintendent of the state police, when he was interviewed, he actually stated that, oh, I have nothing wrong with peaceful protest. And he actually used the word violence to say these were violent. And then he stated um, things like breaking property rules because tech, so the, it, the, the IU administration actually changed the encampment policy the night before the encampment began because they heard about it. And they changed the policy a few hours before the encampment started. And so the university called the state police and charged them with trespassing and I don't know if they, I don't think they were charged with, I don't think the people who arrested were charged with anything besides um, trespassing. And he used the word violent. Our state police superintendent thinks that it's violence to so commit he, property yes, crimes. So, so you would think that's a straightforward factual question. And you see. I thought so. People. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert. But in my, no, no, you don't. You are an expert as property. much as they are when it comes to knowing whether somebody. Is, you are just as much an expert as anybody else <laughs> when you when it comes to knowing whether something is violent or not. That's the point that I'm making. That yeah. you know, it, different people seem to reach different conclusions, not based on the facts but based on their priors, their prior motivations or prior, you know, um, druthers about things. So when I, mm -hmm. yeah, when I think about the, the Harvard encampment that's going on right now in the Boston Globe, you had a lot of commentators saying things like, you know, they, the, the encampment was number three at the three level, intolerably mm -hmm. disruptive, right? They were going down that 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 list, right? They said, mm -hmm. "Oh, they set up forty tents. They've dra draped iconic John Harvard, you know, statue." Blah blah blah. Three. Mm -hmm. They went right to three. When the Crimson, the newspaper, interviewed the students who live in the dorm rooms, on the other hand, um, most of the students indicated that they were at level one. That most of the students mm -hmm. said, "Oh, these, these encampments are level one, kind of." You know, um, a lot of them said things like. It has not caused significant change in their daily activities. 
or prevented them from studying during reading period. You know, they reported that one student said, um, you know, the volume levels weren't different from a typical yard, you know, like, and occasionally like when the Harvard University band would break out, not too different from that, you know? So the students ha have it at one and the administrators and some of the outside reporters have it at three for the same exact facts. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just getting a consensus about what actually is going on factually is tough, especially when you have people like politicians, activists, journalists, who don't have any experience, haven't even been in the the, the, the camps, mm -hmm. you know, in the encampments, and yet, you know, are opining on what's going on. And you have to wonder if their motivations are leading them to cast the level of disruption much higher than it otherwise would be if they weren't motivated to find them objectionable in the first place. So that's the first problem, just getting some factual agreement. And when I look at, there's, there's a report out uh, called the Armed Conflict Location Event Database, A-C-L-E-D. A recent policy brief came out from the Armed Conflict Location Event Database, A-C-L-E-D. And it suggests that there is a low level of disruption overall. The, most of these encampments are around one or maybe two, but really but between one and two. Here's a quote from them. Quote, while some notable violent clashes have recently taken place, such as on the University of Southern of California, Los Angeles, rather UCLA campus, where demonstrators and counter demonstrators fought at a student encampment overnight on 30 April, the overwhelming majority of student protests since October, here's what they say, 99% have remained peaceful. Okay, that's what they say. And then this other uh, uh, gathering service, the Crowd Counting Consortium, um, yields the conclusion similar to the ACLED. Their database recorded 2,645 pro-Palestinian protest events on U.S. campuses between October 7th and May 5th, 2024. Of those, only 25 events show property damage. That's 0.9%. Oh, mm -hmm. 0.9%, and only 33 showed injured protesters. That's 1.2%. And even then, the researchers noticed that some of the protest injuries were caused by police and counter-protesters, mm -hmm. okay, even if that was 1.2%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though there's this there's, there's wild variation in opinion about whether the disruption is at level one, two, three, or four, depending more on whether you're an administrator or a student, whether you're, uh, uh, you know, opposed to these going in or not, you know, it's kind of like the, what the, the factual situation they're looking at is like a Rorschach inkblot test. Yeah. It tells you more about the observer than what is observed, right? right? Um, but when you do get independent people looking at it, like these research folks I just talked to you about, right? They're saying 99% of them are level one, maybe one, one, maybe one to two at the most, right? So, so first, just getting some idea of what level of disruption. Then the second question is, if you can get any kind of consent agreement on what the level of disruption is, one, two, three, or four, what is the threshold of disruption beyond which police action is justified? Now, that's the key question. And what is the threshold of disruption at which police uh, action is justified. What's, and, you know, um, the Harvard police chief, uh, Victor Clay, you know, I keep going back to my alma mater. I'm keeping up with what's going on there more than some other places. <laughs> so I can tell you really what's going on there. He, sa he said in a Crimson interview that police force sh should have a high bar he, uh, somewhere around four. He said, unless there's significant property damage or physical violence at some level, uh, um, he was not going to send in his police simply because university administrators told him to, right? Mm -hmm. This is Harvard Police Department. This is the Harvard guy. Mm -hmm. This isn't even the Boston police. So he said, I'm not sending in our Harvard property. police. So, and you're saying they have to not just violate property laws, but actually damage, do significant damage to the property. Significant, not just, yeah. not just, you Still know, fire. putting a, 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 a kafia 
on 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 the, on the statute or even right. tagging it with some with, with some spray paint. Or even no. peacefully taking over a building. Right, right. No. I mean, right, right. So that that's where he's coming from. But at the other end of the of the spectrum, you have some faculty and staff who have a much lower bar. They, uh, who who say one may be enough. You know, just mm -hmm. any rule violation, any rule violation justifies uh, no, the right. police that's response. The IU, that's the IU administration. <laughs> yes, that that's you one. That, 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 that that's the number. The state police. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, can't yeah, that, think, that. I can't help but wonder what the response would have been if these students had announced that they were simply celebrating graduation and celebrating how much they love the university and celebrating their graduation. I can't help but imagine the response might have been extremely different than the state SWAT team being called. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, you have some in the community and I saw this even at SC, where the president said, "What justified bringing in the police was any rule violation." That's one. You know that that's a very low bar. The threshold is way down, it's so low that it, you know it's easy to mm -hmm. um, to cross it um, with with no real problem. And what you've seen is that you know sometimes there's a a sharp disagreement between. Uh, faculty and administrators about what the appropriate uh, threshold of disruption should be, uh, right, beyond beyond which police action is justified. Um, I'm thinking about, I think it was down at Emory that they had, um, you know, the, the president said that she thought it was uh, around three or four, and the faculty uh, immediately voted no confidence in her. Um, so, you know, you're going to have that kind of disagreement too. So here's what, ha here's what happens at some place like Columbia when I was looking at that, where you had the trustees seem to be honestly surprised that so many faculty were upset at the initial police action to clear the student encampment before we got to the building part, you know, when they initially set up the encampment. The trustees were surprised that the faculty were so upset. And that means one of two things when it comes to the trustees. Either the trustees and the faculty had a different understanding of what the level of disruption was. Either the trustees thought it was three or four and the faculty thought it was one or two, for example, or they both had the same understanding of what the level of disruption was, let's say two, but different thresholds of disruption mm -hmm. at which police action was justified, mm -hmm. right? They're coming at it from that different perspective. So one of the two has to be, right, to get those mm -hmm. kinds of uh, differences of opinion. Um, and so that is the framework that I'm working with now. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the, big, that's the big picture framework. And um, it is, it's where we see all of these issues being played out now. Um, and I, you know, I'm just still trying to sort out myself. Um, myself, I, I would think three or four is where you bring in the police, you know, maybe four for sure. No question, four for sure. You know, when mm -hmm. there's violence, you know, when you saw those attacks at UCLA, you bring in the police, but you don't bring in the police against the attackees, you bring them against the attackers. Right. Attacker. Right. And hopefully okay. in, in time to actually stop the violence. Yes. That's all you got to do, right? I mean, and, yeah. and then when you get, because you're, you got to recognize that the protesters themselves, by they are engaging in civil disobedience, but that is kind of an, a, a, an expression. There, that's a kind oh. of protest that's a part, and part of their assembly and kind of free speech. You know, it's the civil disobedience, no doubt, but it's also, it's an effort to engage in a conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. It's an effort to say we have some strong disagreements about some unjust policies mm -hmm. that have come out of the democratic process. Right. So yeah. you want to protect that speech. You want to protect their right to go on and carry on that dialogue and engagement as long as they're not too disruptive. You know, as long as it's not in the fore range. And I find it I find it really um, valuable that you are framing this and that you're teaching us to frame civil obedience as a dialogue, not between protesters and the government, 
right? Because that's how it's framed. Like, oh, if you don't like something, then go vote, or you know. Yeah. But but between the protesters and the population and the people, the majority of people who make up the democracy, who are ostensibly in charge of the government, who are not paying enough attention to their needs. Right. Absolutely. Between, I love that way of putting it. It's not just between the protesters and the government, which is often what we think about with respect to, say, the Vietnam protesters or, you know, the civil rights protesters walking And that does make it sound illegal. That makes them sound criminal because they're supposed right. to be using illegal channels to address right. complaints but against the government. They're trying to get a dialogue started, not just with the government, although the government too, but also with their own university community, yeah. with the administrators. They're saying, you, th this is the key point that a lot, they constantly Students. bring up. Exactly. We're yeah. complicit in the harm that's going yeah. on in Gaza. Our university has investments in companies that are arming the people mm -hmm. who are um, causing those mass graves and that collective punishment and that for starvation and famine and, you know, that we have a real stake in that we are. And so I'm, they're, they're speaking to their university administrators. They're speaking to their university community at large, you know, other students. Mm -hmm. This part of a conversation. They're saying there is an injustice here that's so screaming out loud mm -hmm. that we have to do this to get this conversation going, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and to break through, cut through our collective complacency about it, which is very much what Black Lives Matter did, right? Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter was about first shut it down, mm -hmm. right, disruption, and then let's have some uncomfortable conversations, mm -hmm. you know, so we can change things, right? So that's kind of, that. that is definitely what they're doing, and you're, you're absolutely right. It is a part of trying to um, engage in a dialogue not only with the government, but with their own university community. And I like I like the approach of focusing on disobedience because implicit in that is that we're obeying somebody and the community has internalized these laws, these policies and articles of faith. And what disruption or protest does is challenges those. And at, uh, what I'm hearing from the different levels, at one or two, we're engaged in a productive conversation that the status quo, the stuck place that we're at, is not acceptable. Um, and it's mm -hmm. only when it escalates to um, something that threatens people's safety that mm -hmm. that disruption is not productive anymore. And it, it really yeah. sounds like it's about consensus-based decision-making, which is something our commission feels very strongly about. When we found, when our commission was founded three years ago, we actually, there was a lot of turmoil on the commission about how it was going to be run and what the rules were, and people had different, you know, political events. And we ended up with deciding that we wanted to have consent-based decision-making as sort of uh, not not true consensus in the fact in the sense that you're not going to have an emphatic um maybe everyone doesn't completely agree on everything but consent based in the sense that if someone really doesn't like a decision they have the right at least to make their voice heard and make sure everyone's discussed it and it's a and it's a true um you know uh that if that any valid complaints at least are are heard by the rest of us that's absolutely so, it I love like, that. And so um I know I want to respect your time and I know you have another meeting to get to. Um there's obviously a lot more we could talk about and ask you about, but there's only three of us here. And um I think it'd be really valuable if you could, if you have if you're available, would you be willing to attend our next uh regular CAPS meeting, which is on it's is actually in two weeks on Wednesday the no yeah, Wednesday the 22nd. Um and it's our time, it's at 4.30. Cool. So like an hour and a half later than this time. Yeah, let's work that out. You 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 got in touch with my assistant, Maria yeah, Champ, yeah, Maria. right? She, she's terrific. Yeah. She'll make sure that we're oh, scheduled, cool. you know, that we okay. are scheduled. And yeah, we can have awesome. the same conversation. We can set up the framework and then and then run yeah. with it. And um, I'm, I'm also hoping to invite a couple of the student organizers uh, who were arrested. And they were, in fact, um, it, there had been reports to us 
that they were very much targeted by the state police when they were arrested. Like they literally like pointed at them, ran over there, tackled them and took them away. And that the police scanners referred to one of them who's a black man as black a man. black man with an Afro on the police scanner. I mean, and so we we also would be really interested in that meeting if you, if possible, um, to ask you like where the line falls between like racialized policing and just political policing because these were the organizers, some of the organizers of the protest and I'm sure that's why they were targeted beyond their race. Um, one, and the other one is Palestinian, one's black and the other is Palestinian. So we'd be really interested in, in you sharing this framework with us for, you know, that you're developing, especially for campus protests. But there's lots of protests that happen in Bloomington that aren't on campus. Our Black Lives Matter protests took place on the town square, not on the university. Um, so this is definitely relevant to the city policing as well. What, does that sound like something you might be interested Absolutely. in um, also helping Absolutely. us with? You got, you got to consider that. And you know, one of the interesting things that a colleague of mine Aya Gruber has just written a, an op-ed about. Um, it hasn't been published yet, so um, um, you know when it gets published, I'll try to get you a copy. But she she's a uh, feminist uh, law professor, theor theoretician at my law school, Aya Gruber, and in her op-ed, she points out how inter interestingly that. Um, most of the organizers in these mm -hmm. anti-war protests, anti-war and Gaza protests, most of them, like Black Lives Matter, are women, mm -hmm. young women, right? And if you look at some of the people who've been, you know, who've gone viral with the police arresting, arresting them, like the um, at Dartmouth, the former chair of the Jewish Study Department, the, uh -huh. the um, philosopher down at Emory, the mm -hmm. woman who's head of the philosophy department, you go through a number of them, you see that they are brutalizing women. You know, you have these men coming in, mm -hmm. doing some very heavy handed brutalization of women. And even the protesters, I mean, the counter protesters are making a lot of misogynistic noises, you mm -hmm. know, while they are taunting the uh, protesters. So there's a whole kind of the gender, gender as and well. misogyny mm -hmm. dimension to this that you cannot you you cannot miss right you you mm -hmm. you, you you should not uh, disregard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something I keep thinking about. Like, how much how much of this could be considered race, racial? I mean, I and I and and I and I really appreciate from your book learning that I think a lot. I mean, our carceral and policing system came out of a racialized context so in a sense it's all racialized policing and especially political policing is racialized policing because normally the things that people are saying will not be tolerated you know have some kind of racial element to them but it would be it would be interesting to hear what you like maybe even if we could get you to watch the very short uh video of their like po police tackle and arrest and see if you think that there might be any evidence. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's a normal way that they arrest people or if that shows that it was some, there was some racial element, element but. Is, is there a normal way to tackle people and take them down? I don't know. They have I don't know. When I got arrested, I was yeah. not tackled and taken down like that. <laughs> that's something we didn't get into in my framework. It's part of the framework. I'll talk about it next time. And that is, if you feel that, if you concluded that number one, it was at whatever level of disruption it was, one, two, three, or four, you've gotten some agreement on that. Number two, that it's crossed the threshold at which police intervention is appropriate, police action is appropriate. Let's say you've crossed that threshold, number two, right? It's mm -hmm. two or three or four or one even, whatever you think it should be, right? Then the third question is, what kind of police tactics are appropriate in making the arrest? Right. And the, mm -hmm. you have police departments have their own have whole different protocols laid out. Right. Mm -hmm. They have one for passive resistance. You know, that is actions that don't prevent the officer's arrest. And they say, you know, you should there should be no tackling, no use of 
any, you know, kinds of stun guns or pepper spray or any of that if there's just, you know, people being passive. Mm -hmm. Number two, if there's mild resistance, like people locking arms. Or, 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 or yeah, locking arms especially or mm -hmm. getting stiff or whatever, not just going limp. You know, again, there are all kinds of police protocols. You do not tackle, you do not use batons, you do not use pepper spray, right? And then mm -hmm. it's only when you get to level three. So there's, you know, and these, I'm, I'm just looking at police um, um, books themselves that you get, you know, more police force used, right? So mm -hmm. that is another part of the whole framework that we didn't get into today. And just a suggestion, maybe level four, maybe your fourth question could be, at what point is military police, is a militarized police response warranted? And that's a whole different game. You're talking about people literally, what happened to us, people showing up in combat here, full helmet, shield, shin guards, sniper, bear cat. They brought in the bear cat. The, I mean, and just them showing up changes the whole mood of people. I, I'm sure a lot of people got more resistant you know, and more likely to push back when they saw that kind of response. So maybe that could be your question for when is it even appropriate to, because you kind of have to bring them out in advance. Like they came from Indianapolis, so they had to drive here. You know, I'm sure it took them a few hours to get ready, if not overnight. And so it's not, it's not the thing you can call out at the last minute when something, I mean, maybe it is, but it didn't seem like it. It seemed pretty well planned out. In no, advance. it was planned out because my mom, my, like I said, my mom, was coming into town getting ready mm -hmm. she saw them a few hours and, and so yeah i mean maybe that's another question is when does it cross the threshold into a military police response if ever since the definition of a military is the armed force that you use against people who are not citizens of your country right that's what i thought a military is right uh so just having you know I, i'm really interested in this question specifically since the response that have that took place in our city was so heavily militarized i'm really i'm really interested in that question as well yeah we Is were having that com conversation threshold? weren't we during the george floyd after his uh, murder the protests that erupted around that right one of the issues right. that came up was the rise of the warrior cop. You know, why do they have all of these military accoutrements now that right. they, you know, deploy on citizens? And that you're right, we're talking about a lot of times they're coming into campuses where the level of disruption is one or yeah, maybe that's how two. Yeah, yeah, you know, one or maybe two but certainly not three or four. And four is the, you know, UCLA and the Harvard um, chief of police said, we're not coming in unless it's four. <laughs> you know, otherwise you administrators deal with this. They're coming in with warrior cops up for a disruption level of one, mm -hmm. you know? And so that is say, saying something about, yeah, we have to, you know, go back to the conversations we were having three, four years ago about just militarized policing generally, the rise of the warrior cop, why we have this, you know, kind of paramilitary approach to civilian interactions in the first place, all of that. All right, well, I don't know how much of that we can get to in our next meeting, but <laughs> I will try. Yeah, I'd love to hear more. Well, ho hopefully we can share, um, we can share with you like our hope for agenda and maybe you could let us know if there's something you like, you know, you think it'd be great to add and we can sort of have some of it planned out. In good. Advance. So yeah. Thank no, you. So you much. I think this is great. You get, a, you have a good idea now where my thinking is, you know, I'm just trying to develop this yeah. framework and plug things in. No, I think that'd be really useful. And we're just now starting, our commission is just about to meet with the mayor, to meet with the lead about getting a city community res re responder program and we would love for IU to um, somehow, you know, engage with that and uh, maybe have it so that they also had an unarmed responder program that could respond to things like this. I'm, I'm actually really interested to find out. I should contact them, um, or maybe our special committee should, but at Duke University, they're actually one of the model city responder programs that we studied in our report. And they have a Department of uh, Community Safety, which is what we modeled our recommendations on. And so I'm really curious to know if that if that program specifically helped them deal with any encampments they might have had there. I don't know. I should call and look into it. Nice.
Nice. But, yeah. Thank Good. you so much. Yeah. Any any last questions for Dr. Armour? I'm sure there'll be a lot next time. We'll we'll let we'll let yeah. it marinate for a while. <laughs> yeah. Incubate. And, that'll, and we'll... that'll be more of a public meeting. So okay, yeah. Thanks again, yeah. and we'll talk soon. Okay. Take care. Good talking bye. to you. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Man, he's on it. I know. He's got this. He's got a whole like. He's ready for his next book. Uh huh. And there were so many like academic things that I was thinking. I was like, oh, this is like stasis theory and motivated reasoning and like. Yeah, and I was like, oh yeah, this is this is like consensus based decision making. <laughs> Literally, he's saying that our society needs to have an avenue for consensus based decision making, and if you shut down civil disobedience, then unhappy, marginalized groups, aka minorities. Mm -hmm. don't have that channel because they're already minorities like that's literally you know right. the definition is that they don't have a majority and they don't have the more importantly even if they are a majority like in apartheid south africa they were the majority but they don't have the power they didn't have the usually the socioeconomic power right. to actually get their voice um and it's baked into the system that's sort of mm -hmm. one thing that i was thinking about with, that i when what i said to him was disappointing no, baked it in. right <laughs> Or I didn't want to be good at baking. I was just thinking, what are we disobeying? We're disobeying the safe and civil city, right? Uh, but like, it's, not, but it's, not, it's not disrupting safety, right? The civility and civility right. is obviously very relative, you know. And like I said, if the, if those exact same students had taken those exact same actions, but publicly stated their purpose was different. And simply said, we love IU, and they, and they had a bunch of cheerleaders with pom-poms yelling about how much they love IU for a week. They wouldn't have changed the I, don't, I really suspect that they wouldn't have brought in the state SWAT police and right. sniper. Right. You know? They're obeying the celebration of the university, right? Yeah. So... They would have appreciated the topic of the of the celebration and they wouldn't have changed the rules. Exactly. Yeah. Right. They would have just brought them Kool-Aid and donuts or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um do you both uh approve of me inviting Bryce and Aiden to our next meeting? Yes, I wanted please. to check with Dr. Armour first before asking them. So i yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm assuming they're fairly busy, but hopefully I think they're still here on the encampment. So yeah. Yeah. Um I know I saw Bryce on. I saw um, a on, picture of the I saw him on March. Saturday. Nice. Yeah. Oh, good. Is that was that your first time meeting him in person? I didn't talk to him when he was across the oh. hill because the you're outside the ground was yeah, good. There's no, yeah, you you would have had to go all the way to the end where that sidewalk is and then go around. Yeah, and the ground was wet, and so like I couldn't go like well, there actually it is an accessible sidewalk. Oh, is that if, yeah? If you follow the creek all the way up the right side. That is an accessible sidewalk that I goes up to that sidewalk that you can go over. I didn't. So just that. see that for the future. Oh, my. Do not try to take your chair in the mud ever. Oh, no. I was like, I got it. That's not happening. Um, so I'll invite them to that meeting. And I'll try to make some sort of a plan for the, you know, meeting. Um, oh, the other thing that's going to happen at that meeting is Kathleen from IU is going to be bringing two of her students oh, to report sure. on and share their work with us. Nice. Yeah. So we just need to time it. Um, and actually, I want to share with you that same day, earlier in the day, Kathleen and I are traveling to Indianapolis to present a digital poster that she made, like a short slideshow about the students' work and the collaboration with the CAPS Commission um oh, at a public health yeah. conference that she got, awesome. yeah she submitted it and got invited and so then and asked me if i wanted to attend with her yes I that's her. awesome yeah. yeah she's taking a university car because obviously my truck won't make it uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it would be so cool yeah so that's exciting and so that's actually happening earlier that day i think it's like at 11 and so I just told her we definitely have to be back by 4:30. Yeah. And so it's gonna, it's actually gonna work out perfect because we're all gonna be together anyway. So we can just show up here, roll in. Yeah, maybe we can stop and grab something to eat in between, yeah. ideally. 
So yeah, we'll just have to time that. We could ask for the meeting to go two hours again, like we did last time. I mean, we don't necessarily need to do that every time, but I feel like it might be warranted when we have so many special guests, especially someone as prestigious as Dr. Armour. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna have Bryce and Aiden, and we'll wanna give them enough time to share their experience and feel like, you know what I mean? Right. So maybe it'll be warranted to try to ask people in advance to give us two hours again. Yeah. And we'll all vote for us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we're pretty close to majority. Right. So maybe that's something you might think about doing as chair pretty soon as asking people to um, be to consider letting us make the meeting two hours. All right. We're inviting all these other people to it. So what they consider consider playing the schedule two hours instead for the meeting. Just like you did before. So people sort of expect it ahead of time. Just letting them know that we plan to we plan to make that motion at the beginning of the meeting again because we've got special guests. And that has to be a motion in a meeting. We can't do that via email ahead of time. I think we can do it via email ahead of time. I mean, I don't know, Ash might argue with me if they were here, but I mean, we can certainly, I think we should arrange it ahead of time. So everyone sort of is on board. Right. And then, and then Ash is probably gonna require us to make a motion. Okay. Well, I'm just thinking of last time Todd oh, said he had to leave. Oh. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a hard. Well, no, that's vote. what I'm doing in my head. I mean, it's a majority vote, so. Anyway, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. So, um, okay. So then, before we go, it's four o'clock now. Um, I don't know if anyone has to run out or. No. Okay. But I'm I mean, hoping we could just discuss those other meetings. Did you see we got uh, an email back? About yeah, the I did. Yeah. So about what. They said oh, that they, the, they, the, we're not in the hierarchy of the universe. Yes, and they will not respond to us. I am a right. PhD candidate. I wondered if we could. Yeah, I was like, them. well, the old IUPD chief will probably respond to us, right? So, so um, I bet you we can get him to talk to us about why your politics are flawed. <laughs> Yeah, so what do we think about IUPD? Do we think that it's worth trying to follow that up any further? Or should we simply try to talk to the mayor and the state police? I think the mayor and the state police. I agree. And we could also include that we Frankly, would if we, were gonna talk, if we were going to follow up with anyone at IU, it would be the administration. Yeah. Because they're the ones they're the ones calling the shots. They're the ones who decided what IUP I assume what IUPD would do and the state police would do would be administration. Yeah. So basically talking to IUPD would be like, well, what did the administration tell you to do? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And I mean just what Jody or Dr. Armour said um had me think the vote of no confidence. We could talk to uh, the faculty council in oh. what they expect. What do they that's a disobedience in a certain way. Right. right. Yeah. So what do they expect? What's happening with that? What it, so we could talk to a representative. That's a good idea. Because that's administrative. Is a, a or the like, graduate workers council, those kids that were all at our meeting. Yeah, I G S. Yeah. I G W C or something. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Who are who do you think would be better? So Bryce is an organizer. Yeah. In in that. So oh, he's, is he? he's okay. <laughs> that's how I know him. Yeah. Oh. That. But maybe the faculty work. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I, one of the yeah, well, of I feel like you know we do need to make some decisions about how much we can engage or who we can engage with, right? We don't have endless amounts of time, right? And so perhaps leaving the administration for now, because I actually feel like what I would like to come out of this is for. IU and particularly the administration to recognize the value in them partnering with our future community response program. Right. And accepting and engaging with us and helping us design it and making an IU version of it, you know. Uh, so that's another reason I think we need to reach out to the to Duke if they and talk to them, the Durham, North Carolina yeah, people, right. and see how they've collaborated with campus, if, if at all. So, I mean, I'm assuming they they have, but it'd be nice to find that out. Do you feel comfortable doing that as the chair of this committee as well? Mm -hmm. Or would you would you like to appoint me to help with that effort <laughs> specifically? Yeah. 
Good. Good. Special committee. Definitely. Like, like what is what is the, yeah like the the arm <laughs> the duke Don't arm. Doubling in the SWAT team again. <laughs> right. The the duke. The hand. Could, I'll be the hand. Like in the the dress the that show. What's the show? Oh, uh, the Adam show. Family. No, the. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. No, that one where they're all medieval, the, what is it called? It's not Lord of the Rings, it's the something about dragon, the one with the dragons in it. Yeah, Dungeons and Dragons? Um, no, that's <laughs> too old. How old are you? You're younger than me. I'm talking about the one where they've got, so, you know. Oh, I know what you're talking about. The, yeah, the, the TV show, Thorn, something. The one where it, I don't like watch it. Lady. Yeah, I know what and you're talking about. It's like a medieval, Game, they're all fighting. Game of Thorns. Game of Thrones? Game of Thrones. Thrones. Yeah. A thorn, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I could be the oh. hand. You never watched Game of Thrones? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I, I've I've like, like, the, right hand, the right hand man who's like the scheming, oh, you know, one. He's oh. called the hand of the king. Yeah. Oh, so it's a little more subtle than being arm, the arm, yeah, the hand. But, the hand. But I like hands. When you say talk to the hand, it'll be me. Yeah. <laughs> when you next time, yeah, when you tell someone talk to the hand, you mean they should laugh. <laughs> talk to the hand. I'm not ignoring you. I'm just. So yeah, I'll do that. I'll, fo I'll follow up um, with Duke, and um, okay, oh. so I'm making a list real quick. Najla, I'm gonna follow up with. Bryce, Aiden, and Duke um, slash Durham. I'm actually following up with Durham, the city of Durham on their program and finding out what their collaboration is. And then Jason is um, following up on, hopefully you can get an interview with this ISP guy because he talked to all this press. Why wouldn't he talk to us? Right. You know, um, and you already reached out to the mayor. Yeah. And are you following up on anything else? That's it. it for, yeah. For this. Oh, we just said the faculty council. Yeah. So yeah, what do you think about that? Do you think we should just sort of wait a minute? Like, I'm writing an email to something and I can't remember what it is now. For this committee? I thought so. No, maybe. Oh yeah. Just to ask the commission that we're gonna need two hours from this. All right. Yeah. Write that down. Okay. Please send me a reminder. Mm -hmm. I will. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Cool. Yeah. What do you think about following up with the faculty council? It might be a little too sort of mm -hmm. outside of our zone. Yeah. I mean, I would have connection. Um, and depending on the contact, I, mean, I might as have the met commission. Them. I mean, as right. the commission as a Commission of the city. Well, we could say we've been trying to. It was, uh, hmm. I mean, the government came in. They're they're the police, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, we're trying to protect safety. I think that's what within our our mission, and I think they would be open. I think it'd be valuable for us to have a contact with the faculty council because when we get to our community responder suggest program suggestions, and even, like I said, I actually hope we can engage them right at the beginning to help right. us design it, then it will be valuable to have, have their the, faculty, ideas and the faculty council supportive of this. Like if we could get, say, the faculty council and the graduate workers council both to like vote to officially endorse them to collab the, the university to collaborate with us on this, for instance, you know, that could add a lot of backing and make it less likely for them to just reply, we're going to decline this generous invitation. <laughs> he must decline this opportunity as he does not intend to meet with anyone outside, outside of the, the university, university hierarchy. hierarchy. You got it perfect. <laughs> it was a very nice, um, the, it was a very nice way to decline a meeting. I've never, I've never seen one so nice. But anyway, this will make that more less likely to happen if we can get the faculty and the graduate workers behind this before we ask for a meeting, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would hope that once we get the mayor on board, 
and BPD on board that they could convince IUPD in the IU administration to come on board. But I think it's gonna be a lot easier to do that if we also had the faculty and graduate workers behind this. And we've, are, we've, we've started with a great relationship with them. So why not continue and see if they're, if they're as excited as we are the graduate workers. to have an alternative force that could be called in times like this, you know, for um, emergencies. I already I saw um, one of the rhetoric faculty is on the faculty council. I could ask him for his uh, perspective. Perfect. Great. If I can get hold of him, he's. And the graduate workers, um, or Bryce and Aiden might also have suggestions, but yeah, go ahead and follow that up. And if that doesn't work, let me know and I'll ask them if they suggest anyone from the faculty council. Okay. Well, maybe they have an official email. You could go look for those. Uh, the true uh -huh. is on the faculty council as well. So they're, they're, he's one of the ones they're trying to... Yeah, I would not reach out to him. No? <laughs> no, because I think his name was on the the list of people they're asking to resign, isn't it? Right. Yeah. He's the assistant, the, the dean. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. Well, I mean, they've got to be, I guess. Okay. So I think that was a very successful meeting. I think until we get any other meeting scheduled, we don't really need to get together. And I don't I don't feel like we the special committee needs like a weekly or bi-weekly meeting or anything. I feel like once we get a meeting scheduled, then we might say, okay, now we want to meet and make a plan or something Set before, or we could even just plan it by email. You know, this time we sort of just did it separately. But um they'd probably be better next time to actually, you know, share what we're thinking of asking ahead of time so that we've got it all sort of coordinated better. On the document. Yeah. Yeah. But it worked out okay. I have way too many questions for him. <laughs> and then he's he's such a great um lecturer I to and very interesting. So how do you get the police? I didn't want to cut him off. How do you get the police to sit down and talk with you? How do you get the police? How do you, how do you like force them to leap to the table? Leap. Leap. He already told leap. us leap get them to come to the table. Yeah, he told us at the panel discussion that leap is the answer because they are law enforcement people and that is their job to talk to the police and get them to that's why we're engaging leap. Damn it, we need leave. I need them to come to the table. Damn it. They're very happy to come to the table. Not just leave. I mean, they still want me at it, apparently. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, we might as well end the meeting. Does he know what all is going on? I vote we adjourn the meeting. Oh. Seconded. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah. Any objections? Nope. All right. Thanks, guys.